because God does a powerful work when we gather together. It's the gathering together that he releases his anointing. And I just want to give honor where honor is due. I just bless Peter and Trisha. I just thank God for your, your leadership for this house. I thank God for your, for who you are and what how you pastor. You guys are really blessed. You have a really beautiful pastor, cares for the flock, loves the flock, and a prophetic voice that sings out and declares out the victory that God has, has already won. And it's our desire to stand in his victory and decree what he's already, de- he's already done it. He's already done it. So we've had a lot of already happening today. And if you don't know who we are, um, this is my husband, Miles, and I'm Catherine, obviously. And I was a California Catholic who God got a hold of very young. Um, I, needed a, I needed him to heal me, to, ho- to make me whole, to save me. You know, I knew that Jesus was um, my Savior, but I never knew him as Lord. And so uh, quickly somebody preached the gospel to me. The first time I heard the gospel, I said yes. She said, do you know that you're a sinner and do you know that God sent his beloved son to be the bridge so that you could have eternal life? Do you want that? I said yes. Aren't you glad that we can say yes? When we say yes, God makes a way where there seems to be no way. And so the first date that I had with Miles, I said, listen, I need you to know that God's done something really real in my life, that I have just received Jesus, and if you want anything to do with me, you got to get to know my man. He's the man. He's the only man that can, ha- that can fulfill everything. Say amen, girls. He's the only one, the Lord and Savior, and I have a wonderful husband, and God got a hold of Miles, and that's our story. He broke down the middle wall between Jew and Gentile, and he's made a way for us, and he has a way for each and every one of you. I want you to know that he has a holy way that he has wants to put you on a path, and he's going to give you good gifts, and he's going to satisfy that deepest desire of your soul because he is a good, good father. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Thank See you later. Bye. Love you. <laughs> so she, we were in my favorite organic Hindu restaurant where I was a regular. And she said, uh, I'll shout it from the housetops. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I said, just don't shout it in the good earth. I'm a regular here. You know? <laughs> and um, God, gave, God, God needed to give me the double treatment. I needed the 220 volt job because of my stiff neck. So he gave me the Berean Road of Study. You know, where I, I saw the Jewishness of the story and the connection with Jesus was completely from my people, and I never heard that, and I thought, why didn't my rabbi tell me this? <laughs> and, and then I also needed the supernatural outpouring. Yeah. And so I met God as, some of you, if you're over 50, you'll remember this, but uh, I met God as El Shaddai, as El Gabor, and as El Kabang, <laughs> the, God, the God who flattens. So... I have a similar experience. I want to say that it's really good to be in a house that has this kind of freedom in worship and this kind of freedom in the spirit and in prophecy. It's like coming home for us. It's really refreshing. So I feel good. I'm sorry I broke the church. It was much bigger last time I was here. I think it's because everybody's marching for Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, anti-Semitism is on the rise, and the closer we get to the return of the Lord, we're going to have to make some decisions. And you have been called to worship and also to provoke my people to jealousy. And by going and marching in the city for Jerusalem, you are doing what we pray about all the time. Sha'alu shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And you're doing it. And your, your people are there doing it. And I'm grateful for you that you've raised people who get that. I also want to say that Uh, I'm making jokes about the number of people here, but the reality is that the anointing has increased exponentially. It's multiplied since we were last here on every level. And even your your singing and your voice and what's coming through you is is deep and strong. I was just really blessed by the worship service. You have a great worship team. Hallelujah. Yeah. So I usually start with a joke. When you come to us with Israel, we start the morning. We have, our, our tour is full for this fall. It's maxed out, but we'll go again soon. And, um, you know, we have a, a song, 
And then Catherine would bring a prayer, and then I'll bring a joke. And I was trying to remember which joke I told you last time, because I didn't want to do double duty on it. So um, I'm going to try a different one, I guess. So you know, Israel's very small, right? We actually say, when we're teaching about how small it is relative to the surrounding Muslim world, we say it's smaller than? New Jersey. Bravo. You've heard this. <laughs> You've heard this one, okay. So it's smaller than New Jersey. So I'm real involved right now with Texas. My son married a Texan. And his tagline on social media is a, Californ a Texan from California, right? And so we're kind of uh, thinking about that all the time. We're about to have our first grandson. I know I look too young, but uh, that, is, that is happening. And uh, so this Texan is driving through Israel and he's thirsty, he pulls over to a little house on the side of the road and he says, can I get something to drink? And the little Israeli guy says, sure, come on in, have some water. So he comes in and he sees kind of some chickens running around. He said, what do you do here? He said, well, I raise chickens. He said, oh, how big is your spread? He said, well, I have 100 meters out front and I got 50 meters out back. And the Texan says, well, uh, I'm from Texas. I raise cattle and my spread is so big, I have breakfast in one part of my ranch, drive all day and have dinner at another part. And the Israeli says, oh, I know how you feel. I had a car like that once, too. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. So the prophetic link there was that, that I've been teaching around different places about the, the, the feast of Shavuot. Say Shavuot. Shavuot. That's Pentecost in Hebrew, or Pentecost is Greek for Shavuot. And it's one of the most underappreciated of the feasts, which is important because we, the closer we get to the return of the Lord, a Jewish Messiah and Savior of the world, to a Jewish Jerusalem filled with Jews, the more we're going to be learning about these things. It's inevitable, folks. God is building this one new man message, and he's getting us ready, and he's getting you ready to provoke us to jealousy, and he's getting us ready to receive our Messiah. Amen. And we'll both be on the mountain. As one of my Orthodox friends said, very favorable towards the Jesus freaks, he said, uh, hey, Miles, if you're right, I'll be on the mountain like this. And if I'm right, you'll be on the mountain like this. <laughs> but here's the thing. I'm right. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. He is Melech Hamlachim. You can read it on your Melech Hamlachim, King of Kings. That's who he is. And there is no other name under heaven by which men might be saved. And all of the feasts of the Lord point to Jesus. And so we can learn so much about our Lord by studying the feasts of the Lord. They're not the feasts of the Jews. They're the feasts of the Lord. So I'm trying to, uh, trying to understand how to bring a message that not only lets you know about the feast, but also promotes our new book, <laughs> which is called When Heaven Hits Home, Ancient Wisdom for Today's Couples. But as somebody was telling me this morning, it's not just for couples. Everybody needs to read this. Well, unfortunately, very few of you will read it today because there's only a few back there, but it's easy to get online. But this one is a gift for P Peter and Trish for being gracious. We wrote inside of it to you a dedication because uh, you have some great pastors, folks. I love when you meet non-religious people in the religion biz, you know? Like, we can talk about anything. Yesterday, just from the, from the airport to the dinner, we talked about politics and philosophy and music and friends and family and every kind of subject possible. And it's like so refreshing to be in a non-religious religion. <laughs> so remember that, that politics, when we pray for the president, that's not a political act. That's a spiritual act mandated by God, from God because politics is downstream from culture and culture is downstream from religion or faith. Right? The highest thing to influence the earth is faith. That should affect culture. That's why we need better Christian movies. They're coming, though. They're coming. They're coming. It's starting to happen. Hallelujah. And then downstream from that is politics. So we have to begin with faith. And one of the things that builds up our faith is understanding where we come from. And to, to not know something about the Old Test, Older Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and just read the New Testament is like coming into a movie in the middle. You know how it ends, but you don't know why. 
This is one long love story. This is not an Older Testament and Newer Testament. This is one long love story. He is the Lord and he changes not. One of the earliest heresies in the church was from a man named Marcion in the first century. And he's the one who divided the, the world of the Hebrews and the Christians into angry Jehovah, happy Jesus. Bad Jews, good Christians. Law, 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 grace, grace, grace. And it's a heresy because he changes not. And the story of my people, I have my Bible up here and hold it up. I say, if you want to know my family's dirty laundry, here it is. And it's a story of endless grace. Because if we were not brought back to the land, he would, not be, he would be a liar. And he is not a man that he should lie. And he promised us that we would be brought back to the land. Amen. So in this season, as we're counting down to Shavuot, say Shavuot. Shavuot. Pentecost. We're counting down. We want to look up. We want to look at. And we want to look out. Amen. There's several meanings for these, and I'll, I'll unfold them for you. Just try to go online. Let me fix this. Sorry. Technical glitch. Just to establish that it is a fact that God said he would bring us back to the land. Let's start there. Actually, yeah, let's start there, and then we'll go to Leviticus. He said to me, Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. This is God speaking to Ezekiel in chapter 37. And they're saying, the Jewish people are saying, the bones are saying, we become old, dry bones, all hope is gone. Our nation is finished, therefore prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, O oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you. Then I will put my spirit in you. You will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. In your witnessing, you don't have to come out with this because most people are not relating to it at all. But you can know in your spirit that the greatest witness you have that God is going to take care of you is that he brought us back to the land. Amen. After 2,000 years of being scattered, he brought us back to the land and planted us there. What can he not do? Amen. He's, everything is possible for you. And you've got a global picture of how great he is. Your problems, not so much. And by the way, whether you receive the healing or you receive the heavenly healing, you win. Right. You know, the loss is for those that are here. Son, I wanted to tell you that my dad died when I was 18. And it was a very, very hard time. And I want you to know that you know something that I don't know because you have a believing family. I didn't know the Lord took me many, many years before the Lord called me because I met this beautiful girl who told me about Jesus. And I want you to know that God is going to comfort you and strengthen you, and you're going to continue to make your family proud, and you're going to be a man that, that dad would love, would bless, would continue yeah. to say, I am with you, because your heavenly Father is with you. Amen. Amen. Now, this is what the Lord says, Jeremiah 31. Sing with joy for Israel. Shout for the greatest of nations. Shout out with praise and joy. Save your people, O Lord, the remnant of Israel, for I will bring them from the north and from the distant corners of the earth. I will not forget the blind and the lame, the expectant mothers and the women in labor. A great company will return. That return and that establishing apparently is somewhat contested by the surrounding neighbors and the world. Today, the, because it's Jerusalem Day, we celebrate once a year, so the Jews, one day out of the year, the Jews are allowed to go up on the Temple Mount, which is controlled by the Muslims. And what you see when you come with us, we'll stand on the Mount of Olives, you'll look at that hill, and you'll see, you'll see a, an, a Muslim mosque on a Crusader church, on a Jewish temple, on promised land. That promise to Abraham has never been revoked. It's still ongoing. No wonder there's such contention over that little piece of real estate. Location, location, location. <laughs> now, you can't understand Pentecost or Shavuot with thunder, not without starting from Passover. It's important to know there are the three feast periods that Pastor mentioned. Passover, Pesach, say Pesach. Pesach. Very good. <laughs> Pesach. You should feel spit <laughs> on the back of your neck if the guy behind you is saying it correctly. 
Pesach, Pesach. Shavuot, Shavuot. Shavuot. And, Sukkot, and Sukkot, or Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, the three feast periods, which comprise actually seven feasts. Yeshua has completed, fulfilled the first four. The next one he's going to fulfill is the day is is Rosh Hashanah, the day of trumpets, the blowing of the trumpet, yep. right? We're in the long, hot summer. So far, it's 2,000 years long, where God is gathering in the sheaves. He's gathering in the harvest. Now, and the next thing we see in here of, of feast significance is going to be the return of the Lord. We're going to hear a sound, and the Lord's going to return. It's, we don't know how imminent it is, but we do know it's the next one on the biblical calendar. turn that off. I'm glad you could edit these. I got a lesson last night in how he does this. <laughs> you can edit out the bad jokes. You can edit out the heresies. You can edit out... He's actually going to make me taller. It's going to be great. <laughs> we had to get two cameras to take a picture of the families, of the four, two couples. Okay. You count 50 days from Passover. In order to get to Pentecost, Pentecost means 50. It's the Greek. Shavuot is the Feast of Weeks. But if you go back to the, the Last Supper, you heard the Last Supper, you've seen the, the Da Vinci painting. It was nothing like that, by the way. First of all, Jesus was not a blonde Norwegian. And he, I, when I first became a believer, every church I went to, they had him as a blonde Norwegian out in the hallway in a painting. I thought, I don't fit in here. But I'm pretty sure he's my Messiah. So what's going on? Okay. But at the Last Supper, which is a Passover Seder, and I almost brought this during the worship service, the guys had been doing a Passover their entire lives. And before that, for generations and generations, they had been keeping the Passover. And they knew that there were four cups in the service. The cup of sanctification, setting apart. The cup of judgment, what God was going to do to Egypt and how he would take our judgment. The cup of redemption, and the cup of praise. When Jesus took the cup and the bread after the meal, that was the cup of redemption. So they didn't know that tomorrow he was going to give his life literally, but they knew this is the cup of redemption. And they also knew that when a young man wanted to marry a young girl, he would take a cup and place it before her. And if she drank from that cup, she was betrothed to him. And when she was betrothed to him, he would go away to his father's house and prepare a place for her and then come back and get her, but she didn't know when he was coming. And he also offered a matan, say matan, a gift. So no wonder they're sitting there and they're realizing something bridal is going on here, something having to do with a marriage, something having to do with intimacy that we've not known. This is the bridal cup. This is the cup of the great price that the bride price is paid for. This is blood in which a bride price is paid and then a gift is coming. What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. You. He was betrothing them. When we do this Seder and we do this, people get saved. He was betrothing them to himself and saying, this is my blood. This is the price. Not only so, I'm so good. I'm so extravagant. I'm so generous. I'm going to go away and I'm going to send a gift. So now you have the context for Pentecost. When I was in Bible college, they told me Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the spirit was poured out, tongues of fire, and, and that's it. And the church was born. But there's a whole context about the bridal cup, about the gift. He went and he said even later, and I'll, I'll quote this in a moment, it is expedient that I go, but I will send a gift. I want you to wait in Jerusalem until you are endowed with the gift. I'm going to send the gift. He was prophesying with that cup about the matan, about the gift to, to come. Amen. What a gift. So Leviticus is one of the feasts, I'm actually not going to read it. It's Leviticus 23, you can read it. We, we have these Torah portions online. By the way, we want you to get our newsletter. It's excellent. I don't pester you with lots of emails. I send out a newsletter once a month. But there's cards. You may have gotten one. You can fill it out while I'm telling jokes, or you can bring it to us in the back. But what we do is we, we, we have several things that we do. Our, we, during the day, we, we are 
tent makers, so I have a counseling practice. But because of this calling, we travel around the world with the message of Jesus to the Jews and also this message of where you come from to the Christians, right? But in order to do that, I have to leave my job. So we're always looking for people to pray for us and stand with us financially. So that's my commercial for today. But the idea is that we need partners. And I want to send you this newsletter because it's very, very cool. For example, whenever I find a hint of reconciliation, because that's our work, Jew and Gentile, male and female, husband and wife, parents and children, Jews and Arabs, nations, whenever we can see reconciliation, it's thrilling, right? So... Whenever I find a testimony of a Muslim speaking positively about Christians and Jews, you'll see it on my website. You'll see it. We'll post it. We've got some incredible stuff in there. I've got one about an Iranian hangman, an executioner, a Muslim executioner, expert in Sharia law from Iran, on his knees with a friend of ours, having received Jesus and now blessing Israel, blessing Israel. Another one where a, a young... A, an imam from Australia, he's an Iranian from Australia, and he's standing in front of Auschwitz decrying anti-Semitism and standing with the Jews in Israel. It's mind-blowing. Yeah. You know, get out of the box, folks. Yeah. Get out of the us and them. God is making some strange bedfellows as we approach the return of the Lord. We cannot be religious. We cannot be religious. There are men and women of peace out there. They might not look like the box you were told they come in. I'm one. I know it. Okay, so, the, so in order to understand this season, because it's a season of resurrection life, anybody here need a miracle? Yes. Yeah. This is the season when Yeshua rose and was on his way to getting ready to ascend. And during that time, there were very unusual and multiple appearances of himself with the disciples and those in the, in, the, in the land. So I believe, and we've already begun to see it, that he wants to visit you in a very unusual way. And whenever he shows up, whenever there's presence, miracles happen. Right? And this is that season between, between Passover and Pentecost. So we need you to look up, first of all. And we learn this in our marriage, too. This is how I'm going to try to connect these two. We used to joke. We did television for six years. We used to joke about it. Miles can connect anything to anything. So watch this. So we need to look up. Now, we learn this in our marriage. And if you don't know this in your marriage, you need to learn this. You do not have enough love for your spouse. And they do not have enough love for you. Shocking. I mean, we've never had a fight, so I'm speaking theoretically. But I've heard that we need to draw on something greater than ourselves. We've got to. And we learned it really early on in the marriage. We were taught in Bible college to have a conference table. And you get in a jam with each other, you go to the conference table. And it's dedicated to that, working that out before the Lord. Except our apartment was so small, there was no room for a table. So, So we had conference chairs. So we would go sit in the chairs and beg God for mercy and work it out together by looking up and saying, God, you need to give us something from on high because we don't have what we need. And that's the season that we're in. It's a time to look up. Sounds like this, very simple and familiar, familiar verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. And we would do this chronically, more than having a formal prayer life together, although we did incredible intercessory prayer in the congregations we served, and we just learned to love the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. Our kids did too. In fact, it was so palpable. It's kind of like the service this morning, the worship service. The presence of the Lord and the power of the Lord is so palpable, you can feel it. It's like, wow, this is great. I feel a lot better. You should leave here in better shape than you came in. And if I go too long, tell me. One service I was preaching, and I just said to the first row, when does, this servant end? when does this service end? And the lady said, 15 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to give me the high shy. If you, I'm okay. I'm not sensitive about it. I can wrap it up. Um, our sons were raised in the atmosphere that you are used to worshiping in, right? We would pray two, three hours in the morning, two, three hours at night, because we'd send our pastor overseas, and then we would gather and pray for the gospel going into India and Africa and Malaysia and all around the world. And one day, Kath and I, I won't let this get out, but we were having a fight in the car. And my son was in the 
car seat. He was just, you know, one and a half, two years old. And he's sitting in the back seat, and we're kind of going at spirited fellowship. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, Jonathan says, where's Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> he was one of my great teachers. He also would, and he's still in diapers, he would get wedged between the chair and the wall, and he yelled, stuck! And I thought, that's a good prayer. That is a good prayer. I'm receiving that prayer. And since that time to this day, I say, stuck. And Jeremiah 33.3 is a key signature for us. Call unto me. God's phone number, Jeremiah 33.3. Call unto me, and I will hear from heaven and show you great and mighty things that you do not know. We have all, all kinds of stories about that particular verse, but that is a life verse. Like We do not have what we need. We need to look up. Yes. And, and we can't get so good at what we do religiously and in the way that we do the thing to forget that we need to look up. We're still dependent. Amen? Yes. The other thing we need to do is look at. I, the need for God is a miracle. I think this is in the book. We were doing, we've done marriage seminars from Hawaii to Siberia. I prefer Hawaii. But we, we've, done, we've done them all over. But we were in Siberia. It was so precious. These folks had been married under communism. And so they had a rubber stamp marriage. Now they were all getting saved. So we had about 500 people in this conference. And they, the married people there had been married with this, just this secular stamp. And they really wanted Jesus in the middle. So we trained them about marriage. We talked about stuff. We spent time with them. And at the end of the week, we remarried them with the Lord. You know? And it's just like the weeping and the garlic. It was so great. And, <laughs> and in the midst of that, we were doing counseling in between the ses- sessions. And if you can imagine, there was a man who was a drunk and an abuser and his wife. And, and it was Catherine and me and the couple and an interpreter on our knees, talking about the most you know, significant and intimate things. And this man got totally delivered, yeah. got came to, miraculously delivered from alcohol, his anger. Obviously, you need to follow up with that things, and they did. We set in place ways for them to follow up. But that deliverance was completely from them looking up. Yeah. They were able to look up. And because they looked up, God met them with a miracle. And we've seen it around the world. We've seen it all the time. We also have to look at in this season. You have to look at, Song of Solomon says, Ani le do di ve do di li. It's everybody. <laughs> nice try. I did that once in Berkeley, and this guy in perfect Hebrew, not that, a much longer verse, this guy in perfect Hebrew gave it back to me. I was like, who are you? Turned out to be, become friends of ours. They're missionaries to Israel. All right. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Right? You, you keep to each other. You keep looking at each other. Catherine, when we first, first became believers, she, there was a song from Stormy O'Mardian, I'm believing for the best in you. And she would say that to me. She also would say, keep changing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm believing for the best in you. And we need to learn how to do that. We need to learn how to look at and believe for the best. And you need to believe when you look at the Lord that he is saying that to you. I'm believing for the best in you. He's believing for the best in you. He's looking at you. He's not nervous about your frailties. We don't need to hide our frailties. He knows. You know, vulnerability in marriage, for example, vulnerability is, is for women, it's usually physical. No matter how perfect they think they are, or how perfect we think they look, they feel vulnerable. For men, it's emotional nakedness. We don't want to talk about the stuff. We don't want to be vulnerable. You know, we're raised to rub some dirt on it, walk it off. You know, don't be a wuss. Stop yet. Just, you know, man up. And so it takes, it takes some practice to be vulnerable with each other, to look at. And it's like that with the Lord. I got to be able to say, ah, God, look at this mess. And see, you know, I already knew. You know, God never says, hey, I just thought of something. <laughs> He's omniscient. He already knows the end from the beginning. He's not taken aback or surprised by our stuff, right? Two doctors that I was working with, and she had thrown him out. These are MD doc- these are doctors. She had thrown him out and locked the doors, and they had two daughters, and the daughters set a trap. I think they got it from a movie, but they set a trap, and they, they invited the dad over, and they set up the romance cafe 
with the white and red checkered tablecloth and the candle in the bottle and the thing with the lady and the tramp look, the whole thing. They did that whole thing and they served dinner to mom and dad. And, and in that process, mom and dad learned to look at each other again and begin to see what the, the, the 80% that's right, you know, we could always see the 20% that wrong, that's wrong. In, in my case, maybe it's 35, 40%. She sees, I don't know. She's very kind about it. But the idea is to concentrate on that which is positive. And so it is with our walk with the Lord. Some of us are not naturally positive. We're cynical or sarcastic. Don't raise your hands. But I usually quote Jesus, but sometimes Jack Nicholson just comes out. And I, I didn't mean for it to happen, Lord. I'm sorry. I, I repent. But, you know, and but other people are kind of naturally positive, right? So I need to learn about that. I need to learn from that. And so it is in my relationship with the Lord. I need to look at and allow him to see what I'm vulnerable with and to really receive from him. You know, these shootings, not the one that just happened, but I'm going back a month because they happen so frequently. The synagogue shooting, that man in, in Poway in San Diego, he claimed to be a born-again evangelical Christian. Did you know that? You didn't know that? Yeah, that young man who went in and shot the rabbi rabbi's hand, a lady stepped in front of the rabbi to save his life, and she got killed. A young girl was hit by a stray bullet. That whole mess happened by somebody that claimed to be a born-again evangelical Christian. What does that say? It says he didn't really look up, and he didn't really look at. Because if you see Jesus, you're not going to do anything like that. So we need to guard that. We need to guard our hearts and make sure we're looking at, and we're not getting some form of religion denying the power thereof. And we need to look out. This has two meanings. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. This is John 4. But I say, wake up and look around, for the fields are already ripe for harvest. One of the keys for this season of coming into the fullness of the Spirit has to do with being connected to a purpose greater than yourself. That's what the harvest is about. Can I just get out of the way and get into something that's bigger than me? That has kept us. We're so different from each other. California Catholic, New York Jew, Woodstock generation, Nordstrom generation. <laughs> OCD level of reading from a young childhood, California education. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find a right way to say that. And what I'm trying to say is we're very, very different, you know? And we, we've been kept, I believe, by having a purpose greater than ourselves, right. by leaning into the kingdom, right. by leaning into what do you want, God? What's important to you? I know souls. That's the most important thing to you. Then I know character. That's the most important thing to you. And then you're kind of fond of the fruit of the Spirit, too. I mean, the, the gifts of the Spirit, too. You know, there are things that God, close to God's heart. And the greatest of these is love. Yeah. And love includes confrontation, folks, by the yes. way. We don't want to be so swept in our own niceness that nothing ever happens. I have a guy, a guy came to me in counseling. He says he's leaving his church. I said, why? He said, because all they keep telling me every week is to be a nicer person. I need to hear the meat of the gospel. I need to hear prophetic times. I need to know where we are in time. I need to see the spirit, spirit movie, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not against being nice. I'm not that good at it, but I'm not against it. I believe it's of the Lord. But there's, it's okay to confront in love when needed yeah. and when necessary, right? So we look out. So the first application of looking out is finding a purpose greater than ourselves. And the second one is to look out for each other. That's why when I see something like this and I hear a testimony of what's happened with the church and your family, it does me good. It does me good. Because we need to look out for each other, whether it's in marriage where we believe for the best and watch over and don't uncover and don't shame. I can't tell you the myriad number of times that Catherine has covered me and made me look better than I am in public, you know, or in some setting where she has gone out of her way to be gracious and to let me know, you know, I'm, I'm not uncovering, I'm not shaming you, I'm not going to, nothing like that. It's just, you know, it's the love of God. Above all, Peter said, have fervent, unfailing love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. This is the Amplified. It overlooks unkindness and unselfishly seeks the best for others. That word fervent is the Greek word for stretching out 
as you get to the finish line in a race. It's stretching. It's both stretching before the race and at the end of the race. It has to do with stretching ourselves so that the other's well-being is above our own. We had a mentor when we were very young in the Lord. She was a dis- amazing woman of God named Hattie Hammond. She's with the Lord now. She never married. She kept herself to the Lord. She was one of those real saints, you know, just an amazing person. And she said, we were talking about marriage. She said, oh, honey, it's easy. Whoever gets to the cross first wins. <laughs> In other words, whoever finds the place of self-sacrifice on behalf of the other one oh. is actually manifesting the love of God in the marriage. Ouch. Hurts good. So, so there are seven weeks between Passover and Pentecost. It's seven times seven. That's why it's Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Seven sevens and then one day. This is actually, I know it may seem like I'm giving you random thoughts on God, but really I'm not. I have three services that I do to, to build this context and do this thing. So I'm giving you God's greatest hits. Because <laughs> I only have one service. During this season, leading up to Pentecost, we do the counting of the Omer. It's a season of harvest. And so we're gathering the, the wheat harvest, the barley harvest, and then the wheat harvest. And we're gathering the, and we're waving the sheaves before the Lord and thanking him for the harvest. Are you grateful today? Yes. You should be grateful today. Yes. If you are a born-again believer, then you should be grateful today. And if you are not a born-again believer, do not leave here without Jesus. Amen. I'm begging you. I'll tell you what, it doesn't make life easy all the time, but you're never alone. Amen. And that's worth the price of admission, folks. That is worth it. And I'm so grateful to the Lord. I was a mess. From my bar mitzvah to age 33, I was all what my friends called my magical misery tour. Included hitchhiking around the country and drugs and alcohol and a lot, a lot of darkness and just bad, 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 bad. And this most beautiful girl I ever met. She says, Jesus is the Messiah of the Jews. I thought, what? I'm a Hindu in my own mind. I'm a guru in my own mind. I wasn't either. And I said, God, I wouldn't say Jesus because my grandmother would roll over in a grave. I said, JC. I thought I'd throw him a bone. JC, if she's right, you need to send me guidance. I was alone in my room. You need to send me guidance. The next day, a man walked up to me in a parking lot, and we talked small talk. He's listening to music coming out of my car, and he said, oh, yeah, I played piano for Van Morrison, but now I'm training to be a pastor. And I said, I have no idea what that was. I just knew he looked like a conservative. I, I didn't know what was going on. And I was frightened. And he said, uh, he's kind of making small talk, and he said, you know, the real reason I came over here is because the Lord said, go talk to the guy with the red car. He's been praying for guidance. Wow. And he said to me, you've been praying for guidance. And I looked around like, okay, where's the CIA? How did, what, what? And God started to unfold experiences like that on me because I was so stiff-necked and so dark, and I knew so little about the Bible. I, I grew up reading Hebrew, going to Hebrew school three days a week. I lived in a kosher home. My parents built the synagogue in the neighborhood, my family. You know, it was very Jewy, but I didn't know God. And as far as I knew, that was just dead religion, and I needed something else. So other things provided more voltage, and so I sought those. And this guy was telling me, by word of knowledge, that the voltage was coming. Come on. <laughs> it gets it is more, I think some of this is in the book, but it gets, it gets pretty crazy. It gets pretty crazy. So we go, he says, look, I've just done a music... We, we, San Francisco, right? So, so the pastors in training, one was Donna Gacho from The Grateful Dead, one was Pat... Craig from the Tasmanian Devils. This guy was Van Morrison's piano player. There's a revival going on that was sweeping these rock and rollers into the church. And so we had kind of a cool music setup, but this guy's telling me, uh, he just made this tape. Do I want to hear it? I, no, I didn't want to, but I said, let's put it in my car. We get in my car, brand new car. First and only brand new car I ever bought. And we get in there. It's like three weeks old off the showroom floor. We get in, and I can't get my cassette cassette children for uh, for you it's a little square with two little holes in it and you put it in a little thing and music comes out of it but it kind of goes like this but it's you know that's a cassette I couldn't get my cassette out and I looked at him and he looked at me and he looked at me and he said there's a battle over your soul <laughs> I thought, get me out of here 
He said, he said, the devil is real, and he doesn't want you to hear my music. It's a Christian band. He doesn't want you to hear my music. Now I'm sweating, and I want to run away. And I said, well, let's get this cassette out, because now I want to know what's on this tape, you know? So I can't get this cassette out. So I take a dime, there's a key, paper clip, paper clip. We get it out, and the, the plastic cover is melted like that. Have you ever seen a melted cassette like that? I have not. And neither had he. And he looked at me again, he calms, calms me, he looked at me again, he said, the devil is real, there's a calling on your life, and God is trying to get you to understand that. But I am stiff-necked, and so God had to do much more of that, like send Paul Cain and say, there's a young man here named Miles, where are you? And call me down the aisle and call me to ministry. That wasn't enough. I had to go to my friends, my rock and roll psychotherapy friends. We were all training to be therapists. One of my friends was training in this new age idolatry kind of a therapy where you bring a little statue and people would project themselves into the statue. The statue would talk to them and, you know, demonic nightmare. So I go to my friends and we're standing in the driveway and I say, David, everything we're doing is wrong. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And when I said that, the statue's head cracked off and rolled down the driveway. You can't make this stuff up, folks. You can't make it up. And you have those stories. It might not be as dramatic as that. I mean, that's, you know, I was really dense. So God had to like, hello. <laughs> but you were probably softer and more pliable and more open and more spiritual than me. And so God did it his way. But he did meet you. And he did call you by name. And he knows your name. And he called you out. And he's bringing you into a purpose greater than yourselves. So, so during this time, between Shavuot and between Pen Passover and Shavuot, where are we, 1203? What do we got here? Good. Okay. 15? Good. I can do it. <laughs> One time I was preaching, I think it was, we were with Chuck. We were, we, I was preaching somewhere, and I was saying something about marriage, and Kat, I said, you know, what a husband needs to do, and Catherine from the front row, she says, obey. <laughs> so, so when you say hurry up, I, I heard her. She said hurry up. Okay. You still with me? Yes. Okay. All right. Pentecost has a context. The context for us is this symmetry between Sinai and Zion. What happened at Mount Sinai when the Jews came out from Egypt and what happened to us when we came to Mount Zion for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. By the way, all those in the upper room were Jews. And so those are, have such a symmetry, such a parallel reality. It's like God, who is the creator, had a mathematical genius in putting those two together. And during this time is also when Jesus started to appear to his disciples, right? So let's just go through the symmetry first. I'll come back to the other. If I can find it. Okay. So Mount Sinai in, act, in uh, Exodus 19 and 20, they come out of Egypt. Fifty days later, according to the rabbis, the word was given to Moses. So they come out of Egypt. Moses goes up for 40 days, comes back, says, yikes, goes back. On the 50th day, the word is going to be given to the Israelites. They're not Israelites yet. And God gives the law. He gives the word. The law is a bad translation. It means instruction. It really means, hey, here's a great idea, folks. If you live this way in general, you're going to have a good society and a healthier society where people take care of each other and, and things are done in a legitimate fashion and there isn't the kind of cheating and da 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 da, da. That's kind of the extent of it is that it's, it's really about, uh, that's the other thing that's on the newsletter is the Torah on one foot. Gamaliel was Paul's teacher. Right. His teacher was Hillel. Someone said to Hillel, I will become a Jew if you can teach me the Torah while standing on one foot. And Hillel said, okay, that which is abhorrent to you, don't do the others. The rest is commentary. Go study it. So we do this one-minute Torah. We take a teaching of the portion of the week. We read the Bible. We read the Torah, the five books of Moses, week by week. I think we learned it from Calvary Chapel, but I'm not sure. But the... the that was a joke. It was funny, too, by the way. <laughs> we learned it from Calvary Chapel. You get that? The Jews... Okay, never mind. <laughs> verse by verse. <laughs> God gave the law. He gave the word. He gave the Torah. He gave the instruction amidst thundering and lightning. Remember? On Sinai? 
On Mount Zion, in the upper room, God gives the Spirit with tongues of fire. Parallel. The Sinai is considered the birth of Judaism. It's when we were born as a nation. It happened to be the slaves for 400 years. Zion is the birthday of the believers in Yeshua, right? It's when we were born as a community. The receiving of the Torah ratifies our calling, a priestly calling, as a kingdom of priests. This is now an instruction that has to do with us bringing this light to the world. We have this treasure that now we can share with the world. On Mount Zion, receiving the Spirit made the church a cohesive family of believers, a kingdom of priests. Become, in fact, re regarding that cup of redemption, that's where we become Kalat HaMashiach, the bride of Messiah, because that was a bridal call. That was a wedding day for the Israelites, for the Hebrews, and God. And this is a wedding day for the born-again believers. It's a wedding day. Yeah. Good. goes on. At that time, there was great joy. Just incredible joy when the word was received. A lot of trembling going on too. But the ultimate extension of that is the receiving of the word brings great joy. By the way, that's why the Jews today on this holiday of Pentecost, of Shavuot, they eat dairy foods. Why culturally? Doesn't make a lot of sense. Why? Because it's receiving the milk of the word. Thanking God for the milk of the word. We also read the book of Ruth. Why? Because Ruth is the perfect picture of meeting in the harvest field, a bride and a groom, a Gentile and a Jew, a harvest greater than ourselves, a purpose bigger than ourselves. And it's one of the most beautiful end time pictures of the church. My people today are Naomi. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. We are outside the covenant. Most of us don't know our Messiah. You are Ruth. You're the friend. You're the friend. You're the one who says, your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you go, I will go. Where you dwell, I will dwell. Where you die, I will die. And the love that you carry, those people watching in New York City today, that's the provoking to jealousy that we need. We need to see the signs and wonders. I need to see them. But it's the love that you have within you that is un undoing to us. Right now, Israel knows the only friends we have in the world are Bible believers. And we're not sure about that every day, you know. We've got, you know, a couple of millennia to be a little nervous about the church. You know, when, when God, Paul said in Romans to provoke us to jealousy, he wasn't thinking of the Inquisition, the Crusades, the pogroms, and the Holocaust. That's like, not, it's a non-starter. But the love that you carry and the way you walk in relation to the Jewish people, that's why we want to partner with you. Because we get to bring this to them. But you know what happens? You're the one who's going to get them saved. You're the one who's going to close wow. the deal. I'm going to bring them the message, but they're going to look at me like, oh, yeah, yeah. but it's Ruth who leads Naomi into yeah. the house of bread, into Beit Lechem, Bethlehem. It's Ruth. And today, it's Ruth who's getting my people saved. It's Ruth who is leading us into the house of bread. And together, we get something that is exponentially more. That's why I believe these messages are valuable, because they're enlivening to the church. And I, me, we need the power of the Holy Spirit that the church carries. You see? David Davis, blessed memory, who was a pastor on Mount Carmel in Israel, and one of my mentors, he said, we need the oil of the Jews and the oil of the Gentiles to have a full menorah. Come on. And that's the season we're in, folks. That's the season when God is lighting the lamp again. He's lighting the lamp, the lamp that went out around 300 AG, AD. It went out. It got snuffed. It got darkened as we cut ourselves from the Jewish roots of the faith. But now in this day, God is unveiling Romans 9 through 11 in a new way. And so we are now able to work together in a way that has never happened before. And I don't need to become a Gentile to follow Jesus. And you don't need to become a Jew unless you're really enamored of Jewish Ritual, which I told the Nez Pierce tribe up in, in the Idaho, up there, and they, 
they had us come up and do marriage seminars in, in Israel, and the ba- pastors gathered me together. They said, listen, we got this guy. He's coming around. He dresses like an ultra-Orthodox Jew. He's not Jewish, and he's kind of peeling our people off to be Jewier. And, and we're kind of nervous about it. I said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. So I give them the whole sermon about the efficacy and importance and centrality of Israel, Christians' debt to the Jews, and the Jews' need for the Christians. And I did the whole thing on Sunday morning. Then I said, I hear that some of you are enamored of Jewish ritual. And I want to tell you that it's all about Jesus. But if you're really serious about following through. I'll be holding a ritual circumcision out behind the pulpit <laughs> at the end of the service. We'll test your commitment. Great joy at the receiving of the word, looking to the harvest to come. On Mount Zion, great joy at receiving of the word, knowing that the harvest was ripe and that the people are going to start getting saved. And it was the beginning of an era of the Gentiles getting saved by the millions and now billion. Great joy. God is a genius, at least, At Mount Sinai, 3,000 died because of unbelief and because of disobedience. But in Acts, 3,000 were born again when Peter spoke the word. word. At Mount Sinai, the law came, but it was on the outside. Here's how to live, and it'll work. But on Mount Zion, a higher law came, and it's on the inside. It's a higher law, folks. Don't, don't fuss with me about law and grace. You won't win because you have a higher law. This was a way to have a cohesive community on which the Magna Carta, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and any sane, forward-thinking culture has based their stuff on the law of Moses, the teachings of Moses. Amen. But you have a higher law because Yeshua, Jesus, came and put that in your heart. So the law of love is now is now ruling you. That's the law you're you're under. And then Jesus said this. This is the matan. Remember? Passover. I'm going to pour out my life, and I'm going to send you a gift, a bride price, a special extra gift. Here it is. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then when I'm on the West Coast, I say, and that's San Francisco. So, I, by the way, pray for us, not against us, if you don't mind. But San Francisco. Unless one time I said that, and uh, a Samoan told me that actually Samoa was the ends of the earth, and I, I didn't fight with him. I said, I never argue with a Samoan. When the day of Pentecost, when the day of Shavuot had come, they were all in court in one place. So it's a feast of thanksgiving. It's a feast of welcoming. It has antecedents in the Bible. It's not an isolated event where the Holy Spirit was poured out. By the way, that's, that would be a dangerous place to get into replacement theology where you deny the efficacy and the centrality of the Jewish history of the Christian faith because that means that everything started at Pentecost, and it didn't. It was an invitation, a bridal invitation to the, to the guys, and then they, a mandate for them to bring this to the world so that the world might, by faith, by grace through faith, and not, not of themselves, but it's a gift of God, the world would then be grafted in wow. to the commonwealth of Israel, yes. grafted into the old olive tree, and together we would make up the seven candelabra. Amen. And so it didn't begin at Pentecost, but there's a level of fulfillment that happened there, especially for what happened with the world when the Jews would go out with this word in power around the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I've got about another two hours, and I'm not going to do it with you. <laughs> So I'll, 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 I'll say it this way. Go back, harmonize the Gospels, and look at the appearances of Jesus between Passover and Pentecost. And notice also, just as Moses, speaking of parallels, Moses went up for 40 days. It was on the 40th day during this 49, 50-day period. It was on the 40th day that Jesus ascended. And during this time, he appeared. Who did he appear to first? Mary, the women, another way to know for sure that God has elevated women, the gospel elevates women, this bunk about women can't minister and women can't ba 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 that is so off the table. Jesus himself, in his resurrection, came and first appeared to the women. We should get a clue from that. Yes, we should. <laughs> 
And it goes on from there. The, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, our hearts burned within us. And it's God's a sense of humor. If you read Emmaus thinking about, I don't know, your favorite comedian, think about your favorite comedian and read the road to Emmaus with a sense of humor, it'll blow your mind. Because God is like walking with them and asking, so what happened? And, and what, really? Oh, I can't, woo, ah, woo. And I didn't hear anything about it. They're walking with the resurrected Jesus. And he's saying, no, I didn't know what happened in Jerusalem. He goes, really? Oh, my gosh. Then he says, hey, fools. Hey, fool. I don't know how to say it in the Hebrew exactly, but, you know, he begins to reveal the word. So this season right now, and I'll close with this, this season is a time of a bridal call. It's a time of great expectation for the appearance of the resurrected, ascended Christ in our lives and a time for him to open the scriptures like he did for the road to Emmaus. Didn't our hearts burn within us when he opened by revelation everything about him from Moses and the prophets? This is a time for revelation. It's a time for resurrection life. It's a time for a bridal call. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand.